the, the initial topic was PIM, but I'm going to generalize it and talk about memory. Memory from the architecture's viewpoint is often, you know, you might consider that the orphan of the, the architecture world because all the glory is in the uh, processor chips and not necessarily in the memory and or the, the, the memory system. I mean, particularly once you get beyond the caches, as we just uh, heard a lot on. Uh, however, I'd also like to say that uh, th this orphan behavior is actually uh, the users, where the gruel that you want <laughs> is, is the memory, and, uh, uh, and you always want more. And I'm going to tell you today why you're going to be very disappointed going forward. <laughs> so uh, comment, I got a, a ton of charts here. There's lots of uh, pictures and graphs and what have you, lots of statistics. Uh, Ignore the, you know, the details, look at the trends. And, and what you'll see is lots of things going off of cliffs, and that's what I want you to remember. Um, for, the, for the details, uh, the original charts uh, for a lot of these things were in the original Exascale report that I did back in 2008. Uh, there was an update in the 2011 uh, supercomputing, and uh, I have another update that's about, uh, that I'm going to finish by August uh, that should be available. So. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we saw this chart before. Uh, this is uh, R max, the sustained flops per second for uh, uh, the top 10 of the top 500 machines over time. And in fact, you have this compound annual growth rate of almost 2x. Two, Every year, we had two times as many flops as we did the year before. What's, what's important about this chart is this, and this was mentioned by some of the speakers before, something interesting happened in 2004. Before that, we had a very uniform architecture. Uh, and I'll talk about, this is a class that I, we, we started in the Exascale report calling these heavyweight uh, architectures. After that, uh, we had a diversity of architectures, uh, and I'll talk about those. And if you look at the next step of evolution, uh, it's my feeling that memory is going to be the driver for the uh, diversity that we see further on. So with that, um, this is a whole bunch of compound annual growth rates taken from the, the top 10 of the top 500 machines over time. There's a bunch of different characteristics here, and I'm just going to walk through a couple of them that continue. Uh, the, this top curve is R, the R max, the amount that you grew every year, and as I said, that pretty much averaged about 2x per year uh, going forward. However, if you look, and that's from before 2004 to after, However, if you look at what happened, 2004 clock rates went flat uh, or down. Uh, the cores per socket increased, and I have a whole other talk to, on, on the whole rationale before this that uh, uh, I gave at the Argon uh, thing a couple months ago. Uh, the total cores in the system increased even further. Uh, the flops per cycle increased even faster than that. The number of flops that you had to worry as a programmer what you did. Um, and memory per core went flat, or actually has beginning to decline. So that's an indication that something might be nasty happening. So uh, the key memory characteristics that are worth talking about, and we mentioned these before, there's capacity, there's bandwidth, uh, there's latency, and there's energy. And I'm going to talk at all, I won't talk too much about latency. Uh, I'll talk about the others. So there's problems in all these guys, and my view is uh, the next generation of architecture has got to focus on memory and not computation. And I'll show you some, some energy reasons for that in particular. So what do we see in apps? Uh, this is, uh, uh, let's see, the bottom one is temporal locality. Uh, this axis is spatial locality. Temporal locality has to be reuse of the same data. Spatial locality is how often you use data that's, quote, close to the data that you just used. And where we are today, the way we design machines today, cache-based machines, uh, they, they're, they're very nice when your applications fit up here. We have more and more applications for which that doesn't fit. And that includes uh, uh, high-performance scientific code. If you look at a code like CTH used in a lot of sh shock physics, there's a ton of table lookups uh, and other things that go on before you even think about doing a floating point operation, taking into account the type of the data and everything else. So we're moving very rapidly into a, a regime where the current memory architect, cache-based architectures don't, don't do a terribly good job. Um, 
if you, this, this we've mentioned several times before, this was the Exascale, uh, cover of the Exascale project. Its goal was to look at, not exaflops actually, but exascale, a thousand times more computation in the same uh, volume as you would get the petascale. And that meant an exas exascale supercomputer, a petascale rack, and a terascale something that you could embed, you know, say in your cell phone or something. And the goal that uh, was set by DARPA at that time, again, this was in 2008, was, uh, and you've heard this number over and over again, is 20 megawatts, which works out to 20 picojoules per flop executed. And so that was the goal. And these were the four problem areas. The two I'm going to focus on are the, the energy power and, and, and the memory. So uh, just to, to touch briefly on the energy, uh, energy per flop is dropping. Uh, if you look down this, uh, this is energy per flop versus time, uh, and it's dropping. And if you look at the goal, it says if you're, we're lucky, 2020, uh, you'll get there. There's a lot of curves in here that we're going to about to hit some uh, uh, boundaries on that's going to limit this thing. Uh, so a lot of these things, the, the lightweight and the, uh, the hybrid, the, the GPU-like things, have a shot at getting down there, but just barely. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about those two. And when, if you did that, you would get there with no memory and no bandwidth. And I'll advertise this particularly when I talk about the exascale machine, what we came up with as a straw man there. So the topics I'm going to talk about are today's uh, architectures. Uh, memory is a technology. And uh, Pete said, uh, mentioned I was a, a double E by training. So we'll look at transistors and DRAM bits and, and See, see what that looks like. Uh, why is memory a growing problem? And I'll, I'll show you the uh, statistics that uh, bring that out. Then talk about two alternatives. One, which uh, Paul asked me to talk about, was processing and memory. Uh, I'll follow that up by what I think is really going to happen in the near future, which is processing near memory. Uh, and, and there is a, a, a subtle but incredibly important distinction. Memory in today's architectures. Uh, if you look at the architecture classes, in fact, I'll put two of them up. For the Exascale report, we identified two classes of architecture at the time. 2000, and this was in 2008. We identified the heavyweights, and these were the traditional Xeons or what have you that had uh, as many cores as you could squash on them running as fast as they could with as big a heat sink as you could put on it. Uh, the lightweights were things like uh, BlueGene, uh, where you, again, what you did was try to optimize uh, you slowed it down, you threw out functionality, and you, you aimed to package something where you could put a lot of them in a, in a, a volume. This, uh, after 2008, uh, uh, Roadrunner came out just about the time we did this report, and that represented the beginning of another class that you might call a hybrid or heterogeneous, where we put in the GPUs. Uh, since then, we're beginning to see, and there's only one possible uh, uh, winner in this category so far that we'll see, but I suspect we're going to see more. I'll call these the big little architectures, where unlike heterogeneous and what have you, you have that had different ISAs and different microarchitectures for the cores. Uh, here you still have different microarchitectures for the cores, but you have the same ISA. So I think that's going to be a class that appears. Uh, there's also uh, several other categories of architectures for, for which there's onesie twosie kinds of things. And those uh, show up when you try to build systems with a very large amount of memory, particularly if you want it to be cache coherent or something. And I'll, I'll talk about those briefly. So just in terms of pictures, this is a heavyweight blade. This is a Power 7. And you can see the big heat sinks. And uh, we, we like the name heavyweight because you look at the physical thing and it, you, know, you, you, you can't lift those things. They're all copper. Um, what, what's key, and I'll come back to this, what's important about this is these machines, within any one node, there's a bunch of sockets for the processors, there's additional sockets for IO, NICs or, or other, other kinds of things, and um, there's a variety of interfaces, uh, some of which allow the sockets to uh, uh, communicate with other sockets for, in terms of memory traffic on node. Uh, the lightweight, things like BlueGene, and, and we've seen uh, a bunch of discussion of this uh, uh, right away, uh, right before me. Uh, here you, you put everything into one chip. The router functions are in there. Memory controllers are in there. And everything else is in there. And uh, that chip has a couple of uh, memory channels off of it. Uh, this, uh, 
Blue Gene Q, I guess, is the, the last Blue Gene I think IBM has announced. Uh, however, uh, this is not the, the death of lightweight architectures. There are some others that are beginning to appear that I suspect will may make an appearance in the uh, high end. Uh, there's the Calzada-like things where you've got a card, you know, roughly the size of a Blue Gene that has lots of uh, multi-core ARM chips and, and DIMMs of memory on them. And HP has this uh, um, Moonshot project which has small cards with processors and memory uh, put, put on them. So it's, it's, I don't know how those will play out, but they're still a viable architecture role. Heterogeneous, again, these are the things with GPUs. And in this case, um, the, the memory, the, the GPUs themselves have lots of processors uh, streaming for NVIDIA's streaming uh, units, each of which have a lot of data flows that they run in parallel. And uh, it has its own memory, and this, this is important. Uh, you, you, when you build one of these things, you get a lot of processors, but the only memory you can touch is whatever is directly attached to the, the, the socket, and there isn't a whole lot of that. It's a few chips versus the host where you have dozens of, of memory chips attached. And this is a Titan blade, and uh, these are the GPU chips and the GPU memories, the high-speed memories for it. These are the, uh, the conventional sockets. Um, big little architectures, I don't have a picture of these, but these are ones, as I said, are, are um, heterogeneous multi-core, heterogeneous in and microarchitecture versus ISA. Um, bigger cores of higher performance and, and better energy, but uh, pretty poor energy. Uh, littler cores have, are more energy efficient, and in, in many cases, uh, there's the ability for a program state to, to move from uh, a big core to a little core or what have you as needed. Um, examples, ARM has several examples of uh, pairs of these things. These are the most recent ones that are, uh, I think this is the high performance and it's the low performance, but more energy efficient. And if you look at the, the Xeon and the Xeon Phi, uh, that's at least marching down this kind of a road. I don't know if the states can actually move between the, the Phi and the, and the Xeon host or not, but it's, it's moving in that direction, I think. So anyway, and, and this was the basis for the Tiana 2 uh, in June of this year. So in memory in a, any of these things, because that's what this talk is about, uh, memory is positioned at the end of a memory channel and not on, on the processor chip. At most, there's two to four of these channels per socket, and at most, four sockets share, uh, can share memory among them in a, a uh, uh, cache-coherent way before the complexity becomes too great. You know, this, this n squared versus n log n, even n log n for as n gets, begins to get large, gets, gets expensive. Um, and the energy uh, of tra access and transport be is going to become dominating in this thing. And uh, increasingly, this increasingly deep cache structure uh, makes life really hard for, you know, we just talked about complex rules for cache coherency. Uh, when you go to do atomic operations, particularly remotely, which is important for a lot of synchronization operations, uh, remote atomics get really, really nasty to try to do. Uh, and then you punt when you got to do uh, some non-local memory access. And the next chart is just kind of a picture of, uh, you know, a, a typical piece of software where you may want to do a get or put from a memory that's somewhere else. You've got a long... Uh, involved uh, stack of software to go through with lots of communication uh, to go through and all of that to do something which is inherently really simple you know a load or a store an atomic ad or something and, and you go through this ton of stuff uh, to do it and that seems odd as, as a way to optimize things but that's what we do today so uh, looking at machines that uh, do allow memory to be a bit more transparent to all the nodes in the system, the Cray MTA, the XMT, the XMT2, and the Eureka are all follow-ons to that, uh, are machines that have a uh, single shared address space. In other words, a core on any node can do a load or a store, and it doesn't care where that load or store come, uh, is resolved to. Uh, it goes out on the, the network interface, understands addresses, and goes out to the node that has it, fetches the, or stores the data, and, and brings the answer back. Um, uh, SGI, uh, their ultraviolet series, this is uh, a node from the 2000 uh, cache coherent NUMA machine. 
Uh, there's a two socket thing that looks like a normal two socket uh, node. But in addition, uh, their network controller has a whole bunch of stuff, and this is over here. There's a whole uh, ton of extra memory to, to, to create the uh, directories that you need to figure out where things are and, and to manage uh, coherency between them. So this gets, uh, gets to be pretty uh, uh, expensive in terms of extra stuff uh, to handle. Um, the Exascale straw man uh, also was a, when we, when we realized that uh, we were running out of power, uh, we, we had to give up a lot of things. And one of the things we decided to give up was any, any shot at cache coherency. Uh, so that if you, if you need to do something coherently, you got to do it in software. We just can't afford, we couldn't afford to do it, put anything like that in hardware. So what we ended up with is a chip with 742 uh, cores. Each core had four floating point units. Uh, and uh, 12 of these would go on a board and some number went in a, uh, um, uh, boards went in a rack and so on. And end up, to, if you wanted to get to a peak exaflop uh, with this system, uh, you would need just under 600 racks. You'd have 166 million cores and about 680 million floating point units. So that means in every single machine cycle, you have to have a billion floating point operations in order to be, you know, 100% efficient. Uh, and that's, that gets to be uh, pretty tough. In addition, uh, this, each of these processor cores directly attached uh, 16DRAM chips. So no DIMMs or anything else like we have now, but 16 independent chips. And I'll talk about packaging for those things in, in a little bit because that's going to be instructive. Um, the key thing, though, when you add all that versus the flops, you, you end up with a machine, an exaflop machine, that has 3.6 petabytes of memory. Now, that sounds like a lot of memory, but when you look at it at a per core or what have you, you you're going to shudder. Um, and this with some rather aggressive assumptions, as in we didn't throw away, we didn't include the energy for uh, cache tag accesses and stuff like that. It was 68 megawatts. And that was, uh, at the time, the best we could see coming down the road uh, to do. So uh, um, anyway, so now, now I'm going to do the electrical engineering thing and talk about memory. And this is a basic DRAM cell. It consists of a capacitor and a transistor and capacitors store charge. And we're going to store a bit on whether or not there's a, a, we recognize a bit on this capacitor and whether or not it's charged. And if we want to set the bit in here, there's a, a, a vertical wire uh, uh, column bit. Uh, you turn the transistor on and the, uh, the, the voltage on that wire will charge that capacitor to either the one or zero that you want. Uh, to read it, uh, you don't put any load at all on this line and you turn the transistor on and then part of the charge of this, this guy will be transferred to the line and you can look at the voltage change and detect that there's a one or a zero. So that's a bit. Uh, a, an array is something like this. Here's uh, an array of four, four words of four bits each. There are four row lines, so if you want to access the first row, you, you turn this, that row line on and all those transistors will then either read their bits or write their bits to the, to the bit, of bit lines and go forward. The, if you look at the Intel, this, this goes back uh, to the beginning of time, you know, when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. Uh, the Intel 1103, the first commercial DRAM was a one kilobit DRAM, okay, 1K bit. Uh, and from the outside, it looked like a 1K by 1 bit part, uh, but the 10 bit address you need to access a, a K bit it was actually broken into two pieces, physically broken into two pieces. A 5 bit row address, which says, which word of 32 bits did you want? And then a five bit column address that says which bit out of that word do you want? And uh, uh, this uh, breakage of addresses in two pieces uh, persists today. DRAMs today use a, a protocol similar to this. The address is bro broken into what's called the row address and the column address. This is a more modern die. You get to a gigabit part, you can't do one gigabit by one. Uh, so what you do is you break your billion uh, transistor capacitor pairs into blocks. Uh, typical number is a K, 1K by 1K or something like that. Uh, and so each of these little, little tiny squares is a million bits. And they have rows and columns to them. Uh, and you arrange the blocks into chunks called banks. And now an address, 
you start out and specify which bank an address comes into this this part you specify which bank then you specify which block within that bank then you specify which row within that block and then you specify which uh, uh, bits within the row do you want uh, but now you can run those banks concurrently okay so you can be reading or writing one of those banks while you're bringing in an address and a command for the other bank and maybe start those off at the same time and what have you. So a, a modern uh, DDR3 DRAM part has eight banks and if you're very clever uh, you can keep all of those banks busy by interleaving addresses and commands and, and sorting those things out. So uh, a simple DIM, you, these are the dual inline modules that you plug into your workshop, looks something like this. Uh, there's a share row address that goes to everybody and each of the actual DIM chips contributes a small number of bits to the total output. So this is typically 60, 64 bits plus ECC if you, you have ECC on it, uh, 64 data bits, and they all do the same thing at the same time. So uh, each, trip con contributes, uh, each chip contributes for those four or eight bits, and the DIM is capable, actually looks like eight concurrent banks of 64 bits. So what does the memory controller on the other side do to do this? So here's our core or sets of cores. Uh, it used to be the memory controller was on a separate chip. Um, AMD started the trend of integrating the controller onto the chip, and now I think just about everybody does it. Um, that mem the, the cores send addresses. Uh, the memory controller sorts that by bank number, okay? Uh, and then, so it has to, all the addresses that are coming in from all these cores, you sort them by bank number. So this is done in the hardware. You then, within the same bank, you sort them by row number. Uh, and then for the same row, if when you get a collection of uh, accesses to the same row of the same bank, then you go ahead and access that row in, in the DRAM, and then you do individual reads and writes to that row as long as you have commands that are accesses that are relative to it. And then when that's done, you close that row uh, and you go back and, and pick, start another bank. Um, and remember, this is all done in parallel, so there's lots of these sets of row operations that this poor memory controller has to be sorting, sorting through. So there's uh, a simple memory controller is doing a ton of uh, keeping, juggling things around. Uh, that's never been enough, you know, one, one dim on a channel has never been enough. So what we've often done is allow you to put multiple DIMMs on the same channel. All of these guys sh share the same wires. So that puts a, a, a larger electrical load, capacitive load on those wires, which means it's tougher to drive them, which means uh, they take both more power to drive them and it's slower. There's more capacitance, which if you've got a double E background, capacitance is bad if you want speed. In addition, however, uh, now you, you can't just arbitrarily hop from talking to one of these DIMs to talking to the other DIM because they're physically di at a dis different distance, which means electrically they're further they're a different distance apart, which means all the high-speed logic you're using to recognize when the bits come back and you can sample them all change based on which DIM you're talking to. So the controller has to know which DIM it talks to, and there's a syn uh, synchronization sequence it's got to get, go through to take up uh, into account that time difference. And, and consequently, to this address, we now have to break out another part called the rank, which says which of those cards do you want to talk to. So now before you can do anything, you've got to sort by rank, and then you sort by bank, and then you sort by block, et cetera, et cetera. We've, we wanted to put more memory available on this thing, so we put multiple ranks on the same DIM, you know, maybe some on the front, some on the back, and, and too high or something like that. The electrical problems continue, um, and you can still only talk to one rank at a time, but I've got more bits on, on my channel. The, you still want more, so to reduce the electrical problems, uh, there's a now a set of DIMs called load reduced DIMs, LR DIMs, where there's a, another chip in the center, so this, this chip adds cost. Um, and this chip basically presents electrically one, one rank to the controller, uh, but it has multiple outputs that allows it to talk to the multiple ranks on, on, the, uh, on the DIM uh, electrically independently. Um, but uh, so 
th this, this helps with this speed problem, but it does add latency to it. This is one time I'll talk about latency. This guy, you gotta go through this guy now, so that's more latency, so it's a slower, slower access. Uh, we, we've still wanted more, so we've started to build more and more uh, die that have multiple ranks, quote, on the die. This isn't quite electrically right, but I won't go through the difference. Uh, this is, a, again, I, I have references to, to micron parts here that all, all of these are actually implemented. So there, there are now four rank die uh, that you put down on a chip and it looks like four ranks select, uh, logically in a single die. And we're moving towards a system where you have a single DIM per channel uh, simply because you can't uh, electrically afford to figure out physically which DIM on the, on the port it is. And, but each, that DIM has multiple ranks in it. And this is, a, uh, again, a micron part where you use a single DIM, but it has eight ranks and a ton of memory parts on it. Uh, you want more than that. Uh, and so what the architects have done, they've gone back to the microprocessor and increased the number of memory channels. And now it's not uncommon to have four independent memory channels on a socket, which means now, be, uh, when you get to do an address and you want to go get the data, I now have to at least route by channel before I can sort by rank and sort by bank and, and all that other stuff. Then uh, the next level up of getting more memory is when you build multi-socket nodes. And in these cases, you have, and this, these were just mentioned in the last talk, uh, there are specialized interfaces between sockets uh, QPI is one used by Intel, HyperTransport, a lot of other people use. Uh, and these basically will allow a, um, uh, a memory reference to be sent across the socket to get to somebody else's memory. So when you do this, now before you can do anything else, you've got to sort the addresses by socket. So then you can sort it by <laughs> channel, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so a little bit about the, the growing problem and, and these these are the cases where I, I, I just want you to walk away viewing with alarm that the world is maybe falling in on you. Um, uh, this is a plot of, uh, there's a standard metric in supercomputing. Uh, you want one byte of memory capacity for each flop per second that you're performing. That's been just kind of a rule of thumb forever. And up until about 2006, uh, you can see that's, a, again, these are all the top 10 machines of the top 500. That was about the case. They were getting a byte per flop per second. Starting in 2006 or so, you see this incredibly decreasing slope. And in fact, today, uh, the, the number one machine in the world is two orders of magnitude below what it was, what the numbers were uh, a few years ago. So if this is what, what was a comfortable place to design algorithms in, this now means uh, you as an algorithm designer have to worry about algorithms that are two orders of magnitude less. Okay. Now if you want to put that in the different, and this is where the exascale machine would have been. Capacity per socket. So this is, I'm going to kind of move it, more, make it more relevant. Uh, you can see again, this, this looks kind of like there was a good trend line here, but again it looks like we've kind of gone off the rail here. Um, and uh, with at least the higher performing machines, the hybrid, you know, GPUs and what have you, kind of flat in terms of memory per socket. And th there isn't a whole lot of growth. And in fact, if you look at the exascale machine, you know, this is from five years ago. So this is the most recent five years of data. We were right about, we were projecting right about where it looks like the trend line is ending up. Uh, capacity per core. And this is the one that's really important to you as a, a, uh, a software designer. How much memory do you have on each core that's running a, 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 a thread of computation for that core to worry about, to deal with. And uh, again, we had a nice, kind of nice rise through time, but again, it looks like we're at best flat, if not going in the wrong direction. And again, if you look at where we ended up on the exascale machine with 166 million cores, you had almost nothing uh, per core. You had a few megabytes of memory per core. Um, and, and so that's, that's a, I, I think, this, if there's one thing you remember is uh, whatever you do for algorithms, you don't want any, to use any memory. The GPUs are the purple ones. The reds are the, uh, 
Uh, the reds are the heavyweights, the greens are the lightweight machines, the blue jeans, and the purple ones are the GPUs. So the numbers are, are typically, have been and are typically lower. If you look at these, they, they are lower than the, the normal heavyweight sockets. And now I'm, I'm counting on core here on, on the GPU case, only the equivalent of the streaming memory, not all the little data flows. Okay. If I divided by data flow, uh, I'd take that down by another factor of 30. What I, I counted as a core here was things that could execute independent programs, okay, uh, that could branch and, and what have you. And the, the, the little, uh, little things on, in each of the, the, the uh, uh, GPU cores, uh, once you get down to the data flow limit, they don't really have a program counter. Okay, so I, I didn't count, I counted those as wide ALUs essentially. Okay. Uh, but the Exascale machine did have a program counter for each of those guys. So when you did, the, yeah, so the, the, go back to your discussion. The Exascale machine kind of really did count that into effect. So we're, we're down here in a couple of megabytes per core. Yeah, so. Uh, and now, now the reason for this memory density, uh, I'll give you a rationale why this is happening. This is a, a density increase in terms of the number of, tr number of bits of storage for a whole flock of different memory technologies um, per square centimeter of silicon. So as you put bits down on silicon, they've been growing exponentially at the same rate for a long time. Uh, but the size of the die, and th this, is, this is taken from a, this other more general update to the Exascale report that I'm doing. So it's got lots of other stuff that I, I don't care about. These blue circles are the size of a, a commodity DRAM die. And you can see they've actually been getting smaller. And that's because um, unlike Intel, the memory manufacturers, you know, what they lose in volume, they lose <laughs> in volume. Uh, so it's a... a but they, you know, they sell, uh, uh, you know, a buck a piece or something for a, a DRAM chip, and they they can't sell it for hundreds or thousand dollars. So to raise the yield and reduce the cost and do all that stuff, they're making smaller and smaller die, so they get more and more good die off the off a wafer, and consequently have a shot at not, and breaking breaking even. So so the the uh, the size of the die is decreasing, even though the number of bits you can put on the per square centimeter increasing. So you look at the product, and uh, this is the DRAM, and I, I did this for the other technologies too, but this is the DRAM curve. And if you look uh, early on, up to about 2004, we were getting about 4X every three year increase in, in density per DRAM chip. Okay, so now I'm talking about a chip, what you go out and buy. 4X every three years, you had a, a 4X more memory bits on the chip. We're down now to about half of that. Okay, and that's because these chips are getting smaller. The key takeaway here, though, is the, to a first approximation, the number of memory chip uh, per socket that we have in command is not really increasing a whole lot. So as we, as we reduce the number, the, the capacity per chip, and the number of chips doesn't increase, then the, the rate of increase of memory is less than the rate of increase of cores on the, on the socket. Now for the other half of this, besides density, there's also signaling rate okay, that we've got to go through. And uh, this is single wire signaling uh, rates uh, for a variety of, of things. Um, uh, there's, um, uh, these are the DRAM curves, DDR, DDR1, DDR2, 3, 4, and the projections for 4. And looking out over time, these, these rates uh, look like they're going to peak at about 8 giga transfers per second. Um, uh, on each wire. You look at the GDDR parts and they're about there now. Uh, you look at the high-speed interfaces, PCI Express, uh, uh, Hypertransport, uh, QPI and what have you, uh, they're also either now or in the near future look like they're going to top out at about eight. Um, and and there, there is experimental work now that may give you something more if you go, when you go, you go to differential signaling on these things. Uh, where you, but it, that requires two wires, and uh, uh, half of that, you know, on a per wire basis, is in the same range. So, to a first approximation, most of the interfaces that we're dealing with are, look like they're pretty much tapped out. You know, they're they're not going to get any 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 faster on a per wire basis. So, if you're talking about a conventional chip, 
uh, you can ask yourself, how many wires can I get off this chip? And I, I put this on a log curve just so that you, you can see the shape of the... This is the number of contacts projected to go on, on uh, uh, heavyweight sockets over time. And there is an increase, but it's not the kind of nice exponential increase you, you've seen before. So this is the same phenomenon as the size of the chip. Uh, we now have flat uh, bandwidth and a slowly growing I.O. rate, which means um, the, 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 you know, if you ran all the I.O. at whatever the maximum possible rate is, you can ask yourself, well, how much do I get? And, and what I did, uh, as I, I didn't list that as a number, I listed what I thought was a, a more interesting number, is I took that peak possible data rate, if we used all the pins for, for memory, um, and divided it by the number of million transistors the number of transistors on the die in millions. Okay, so in the sense that if you have a, a million transistor unit of logic, how much bandwidth do you have for that die? And uh, you can see, looking forward in time, uh, we have entered a period of uh, maybe not so graceful degradation in terms of bandwidth per die. Um, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about DDR or the graphics DDR that we use for uh, um, the uh, GPUs, or we go to these other high-speed protocols. They all, they are all in an era of decline. And it, there's even less when, when you take into account clock rate. Okay, so now per, per unit of logic, per cycle of execution. So particularly as you go to uh, boosting the clock rate, uh, you know, to, to whatever the power limit is, uh, what you get is it, it looks, you know, even more bleak. So per, per cycle of computation, what this is saying, again, this is the takeaway, per cycle of computation on each one of your cores, you, you can look forward to less and less bandwidth to memory, okay? Along with less and less memory to access once you get there. Um, so with that in mind, let me look, relook at the uh, exascale straw man, and I'll go back through a little energy uh, thing. This is, this is actually a chart that I, I, I did for... Uh, Supercomputing 11, the panel, and uh, I'm in the process of updating it, so there'll be some numbers changed. But the, the overall, uh, I think the overall conclusion is pretty much. In 2015, the core energy per flop would be, uh, you know, about 10 picojoules. So this is the floating point unit and a simple core. And this is for the exascale straw man that we came up with. Very, very simple core, uh, register file, red, and um, uh, four floating point units. So the energy per flop is about 10 picojoules. Uh, this is the path when one of those cores decided, oh, I need to access something in memory. And uh, you don't need to read it, but it turns out there's just lots and lots of uh, what happens if it's in the L1, what happens if it's not in the L1, but in the L2, not in the L2, but the L3, whether I have to go off chip or whether I have to go off chip to a router, to another, another thing, and on and on and on. So, so there's a, an incredibly large number of cases uh, that you, you can end up with, and I didn't even bother doing here worrying about what happens if I get a TLB miss. You know, maybe we just run all real or something awful like that. Um, so anyway, when you do that, uh, these were some energy numbers that are, are derived from the exascale report on how many picojoules it takes to do different kinds of things. And if you took that and, and tried to do um, uh, a LINPAC, and, and this isn't trying to uh, optimize it. You know, this was just trying to do it in what looks to be a pretty rational fashion. Uh, and you look at the steps of LINPAC and you compute the total energy uh, of just accessing memory. So the average memory operation uh, on LINPAC uh, for, for this, this configuration was about 475 picojoules. Okay, this is the memory to support that one flop that took 10 picojoules. So this is 50 times more. I could be off by an order of magnitude on that, and this is still a disaster. Uh, so what, what this says is there is uh, almost no more interest, at least from my perspective, in worrying about the architecture of a, of a core. Uh, that, that's almost irrelevant. It's, it's how you put it together in terms of the rest of the system. Because if this were really the, tr the truth, and where we really accounted for everything, that exascale estimate that we had at 67 megawatts was, uh, was off. It was more like half a gigawatt. So, now I'll get to what I was supposed to talk about, processing and memory. Uh, 
This is uh, a, a rather uh, influential, uh, I'll put a, in, in 94, uh, Paul was one of the organi organizers of this workshop we had in Pasadena on getting to a petaflop, okay? Uh, and in that, in that, there were uh, three architectures that ended up being uh, proposed as targets for a petaflop machine. Uh, one, Seymour projected something that was essentially a big shared memory machine uh, without cache coherency. Uh, Seymour really didn't believe in caches. Um, uh, Tom Sterling uh, projected uh, what became clusters and, and what have you of you know, commodity microprocessors networked together. And I proposed uh, a category of machines uh, where you had just a single part type machine with just memory and logic together, and these things uh, scaled. And this, this went by the name uh, PIM, or Processing and Memory. And what I'm going to do is give you a quick tour, Cook's tour of some of the real chips. The reason for PIM is if you want a lot of memory, there's only one way to get a lot of memory, and that's to have a lot of memory, okay? Uh, uh, current memory chips waste about 98% of their, their data uh, that they actually fetch versus what they deliver off chip. Uh, it's this, this business of the length of the row versus the length of the interface. And the bulk of the energy is, uh, as we just saw, ends up being in all the, the stuff re, uh, involved with transporting data off chip and throwing away the bandwidth that you didn't need, et cetera, et cetera. And an obvious solution is you place cores on memory. Okay, at least that was a point to look at. And still permit yourself to scale to larger systems. So uh, one of the first of these parts, uh, Seymour actually built one uh, for the Cray 3, which uh, never got finished. I actually saw a, a quarter module of the memory with this thing once. Um, uh, this was an SRAM memory part. Uh, Seymour didn't like DRAM, it wasn't fast enough. So everything was out of SRAM. Uh, and it had an extra component to it. It had, at the bottom of the rows, uh, it had 64 one-bit ALUs and a communication path that allowed you to send commands to the memory to process, do some processing out there. Um, and uh, there were actually workstations made with that in, as the memory, uh, in addition to being the, for the uh, um, Cray 3. Um, at the same time, I, I was doing, I had a couple projects going on, one of which uh, I prototyped something that I wanted to do after I did the second chip uh, in, on, in silicon, and that was to, uh, on a memory bus uh, to put a chunk of memory that if you talk to it properly would be able to go off and, and do uh, pretty sophisticated searches through the memory, searches and, and various other operations in parallel through the memory. And uh, uh, this was actually built to implement, if you know the uh, parallel programming paradigm Linda, uh, this was built to do Linda. And at the time, it, uh, the applications we ran ran about 60 times faster than doing the same thing on a MIPS chip, which was kind of the state of the art at the time. The other part that I did at that time was probably the world's first multi-core chip. Uh, you can now recognize, this is a chip, you can now recognize these things as being DRAM blocks. Okay, so we had a, a memory part, this was now 20 years ago, uh, a memory part with eight, block, uh, eight banks, each bank was connected to, uh, had uh, on the chip a small microprocessor. Those microprocessors were wired together to form a, a 3D hypercube, and each microprocessor had a link that went off chip so that you could glue these things together. And, and you know, a primitive form of message passing was used to, to build these things. And we actually built, uh, this is in, still in my office on campus, we built machines that had up to 64 of these parts, with, and they were glueless. In other words, all, the, all you had was the part, and there was no other glue or associated logic that you needed to build a bigger machine. Um, a bit later, Mitsubishi built on a DRAM part, a, um, a part that you can recognize, these are, these are two banks. Down the center was a 32-bit microprocessor, and it used the uh, row buffers on those banks as cache lines. So, so they, they actually tried to use more of that bandwidth than uh, before. Uh, there was another part uh, called the Linden Dam chip that uh, had a, was a 16 megabit uh, DRAM divided into 64 blocks. Each block had a 64 one-bit processors, kind of like the uh, um, Terasys part. And this was built to do uh, very high-speed in-memory text searching. 
Uh, there, then there was Diva, and I, I was part of this project, and, and what we did here was build DIMMs that had memory on them that plugged into a normal workstation, except each of the chunks of memory had a small processor next to it that could do talk to other processors in the memory and do things right there. So you, if you touch the memory in the right way, you could tell it to do things. Uh, Berkeley uh, Patterson built a something called the VI RAM. Again, you can recognize uh, there's, there's eight blocks here. Um, and there's a ve big vector processor uh, down the center of this chip. Then there was a project HTMT, and, and Paul was part of this too, uh, that was uh, an outgrowth of that uh, 94 workshop. The goal was to get to a petaflop by 2005, I think it was. And it was using every technology we knew at the time. The, the processors would have been superconducting things using RSFQ logic um, and, and what have you. And there were two levels of beyond that, let me go to this chart, two levels of memory. These are the superconducting uh, processors. Two levels of memory, both of which were PIM. Uh, there's an SRAM level, which ran, essentially ran the runtime for the, the system and scheduled uh, computations down on the uh, superconducting processors. And above that, you had uh, DRAM, uh, where actually the operating system ran, among other things, DRAM PIMs. Uh, another part, Micron uh, built something called the Yukon uh, that had uh, 256 8-bit uh, processors inside a part that looked like a conventional synchronous DRAM part. Um, this, this part, they built it, but uh, they never could get it to work because they couldn't fabricate it. It used five levels of metal, uh, which at the time was more than you used in memory. Typical memory technologies use maybe three today. And they were trying to do five. When you look at cross sections of this chip, you can see chasms like earthquakes, where the upper levels of metal didn't join properly, so the chip was non-functional. PIM light was a part done by uh, a colleague of mine, uh, where we began to uh, experiment with instruction sets for these processors that were right next to the memory banks uh, that could uh, use the data in the memory bank uh, in a, a collective fashion and migrate on the memory bus. So. The, you could have a thread which went someplace and then it just could decide it really needed to go to some other memory and it would go there. And uh, this, this was a part that we, we actually built and had running uh, on a, a relatively old press uh, technology, but it, it did work as an experiment. Then there's something that's kind of a follow on that and it's actually the beginnings of what I think we're going to see more in, in my final section. Uh, this has to do with traveling threads. In other words, if at the bottom of each bank of memory you have a very simple core, uh, we call it a Gossamer core now, um, that takes a memory reference, and that memory reference is actually uh, the state of a, a very small thread, uh, and that thread literally moves through memory as it needs to without ever knowing where it is. It has neither, neither knows nor cares where it is. And we've actually built a machine, this is a, one of the prototype cards uh, that, that does this. So the last category, and I think this is the, the important one where I think things are going, um, to go back to the exascale straw man, the way we saw these 16 D DIM DRAMs being packaged were in one of two ways. Either vertically something called quilt packaging where the, DIM, the DRAM parts were tipped on their side and soldered along the edges, or on, by stacking them on the logic die. And by stacking, uh, you'd put little holes through these DIMMs and uh, the DRAM parts and metal wires that go down so that all the parts saw literally vertical buses that came up from the logic die. This is, um, I, I think, uh, what we're going to see more and more, and this was mentioned several times, uh, I think, last night, uh, 3D stacked memory. I think this is where, where there's going to be a, a major impact on architecture. Here you have the stacks of DRAMs, as I talked about, with uh, vertical wires going down. At the bottom of this stack, rather than having your big, heavy socket microprocessor, you have a logic chip where you put multiple controllers and routers in, in high-speed I.O. that take you out of that. Uh, this was actually demonstrated. The Micron built a part in 2011. This is a picture of that die. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see little dots those dots are the tops of the, the through silicon vias, the holes that go through the die to, to couple the chips together. And there is actually a consortium. Now you can go download the spec, 
and uh, where they expect the first product in 2015, 2016, where you can get somewhere between 4, 8, and 16 die on a stack, which is 4, 8, 16 times the density you get on a single part. And, and you get a huge increase in both memory density and bandwidth. Uh, the architecture of this thing looks something like this. Uh, your, your DRAM die is broken into partitions. Each partition lies on top of another partition, all of which share a set of wires uh, called a vault. Um, and down at the bottom on the logic tip, there's the memory controller for that vault. Uh, there's also routers and high-speed I.O. that allow uh, essentially equivalent of high-speed messages like, uh, akin to uh, PCI Express or QPI or, or, or hypertransport to enter here, find their way to the right, uh, right vault, go through the memory controller, go up and come back down and, and go out again. So that's, that's the basic HC, HMC architecture. And uh, the, the way they expect to see it, you know, in, in more or less commodity things is you have some number, small number of these near a conventional microprocessor, and if each of those things are 16, this is kind of like the equivalent of two DIMMs uh, next to that socket. And they'd be very close on the same uh, substructure. So you could go further and construct yourself a sea of DIMMs, a sea of stacks, maybe uh, each of these things might be the equivalent of DIMM, and you've got all these stacks on it, and the stacks uh, have interfaces and route signals from your, your, your microprocessor socket. Um, capacity estimates, uh, this is the capacity uh, projection for a single DRAM die. This is what if you take it up into stacks. And the key thing is with a stack, uh, within the not too distant future, you can get the equivalent of a DIMM with about a terabyte of memory on it. Okay, so this is, this is a serious increase over what we get today, which is the biggest you can get is like 64 gigabytes. Uh, this is considerably more than that. And in terms of the internal structure, you know, I talked about today's sockets. You might have four memory channels on a socket. Here inside the part, you, you, we will very quickly get to the point where we might have as many as 64 memory channels going down to the logic chip. All of those are independent, uh, and along with eight links that go out. Uh, the bandwidth per stack, uh, you know, I mentioned like eight giga transfers per second for, uh, as kind of a limit for off-chip. Um, here, we're, we're looking internally to the chip, we're looking at numbers that are orders and orders of magnitude more than that. And with uh, being able to specialize the high-speed I.O. and not use, not worry about capacitive loading and the other thing it looks like we can get, and the fact that we have eight links coming off rather than uh, one on a conventional part, you get more off-stack off bandwidth also. Memory power, and again, these are my estimates based on ITRS and, and some public data. It looks like these stacks will be on the order of 10 watts a piece. Uh, there's been an architecture uh, suggested for this. Uh, Sandia had a project called Ex Excalibur, which uh, projected taking some conventional high-performance sockets, having some of these stacks nearby, as I just showed, and having those stacks and some of their interfaces going to NIC chips to go off and build nodes. Uh, the, the logic chip on these things would have actually several kinds of additional processing on it. Uh, a vault atomic unit to do atomics, and conventional processors to do local computing on, on the stack. Um, so if we grew that up to an exascale, and this is, I, I had commented to some of the students yesterday that there was an 11-dimensional uh, uh, problem now. Uh, to address, if you're, you're a poor core and you want to access something, and I, I didn't include the cache hierarchy, you got to go through 11 dimensions in order to finally get down to the word that you want here. Uh, of, of sorting and searching and routing and, and everything else. And so if you're trying to do an optimal data placement, you know, where, where should I put the data to minimize latency? It's just not here or there, but it's here or there in each of these 11 dimensions. Uh, and I think that gets to be a rather interestingly hard problem pretty quickly. Where I want to get to, though, is if you look at this and you say to yourself, if I have now processing down here, uh, which is near the memory, you know, right, right at the bottom of the stack. Why in the world do I need that guy? Okay, why, why don't I just build myself a sea of memory? Uh, and this is, I, I just called this a, a, a PGAS, Partition Global Address Space. All this memory is in the same address space, and there are processors near each of these vaults to do 
processing that you need done. And if you begin to think about traveling the states as the Big Little is doing, is what we're doing with the, uh, uh, my little company, where if you need to port things, you don't just send a request for the data, you, you have the option of sending out a small threadlet that says, go do this operation for me over, over there. You know, you know, this is remote action at a distance where you don't have to worry about cache coherency or any of that because you, you, do, you don't dare worry about it. And machines like this, you, you know, in the exascale machine, the thought of building a cache coherent system that's cache coherent over 166 million chips is probably, or cores is probably something I wouldn't want to uh, worry about doing. I don't have enough bits <laughs> to, to keep track of that. So uh, anyway, um, that, that's this thought experiment of, of going forward uh, remove the processor sockets and the NICs and just all I keep are stacks of, of enhanced memory. And power for that, again, using the same estimates, looks like it might be on the order of 25 watts. Depends on how many memory parts you got in the stack. And when you do a flop projection, uh, you're at least in shooting range. You can see it from there. You know, you're not orders of magnitude off. So conclusions, memory we, we absolutely need it. We don't have enough of it. It's going to get worse. Uh, limitations come from architectures that separate the memory from the computation. Uh, PIM was an attempt to overcome that. Uh, it looks like, uh, I, I really believe that something like 3D stacks that enable massive processing near memory have a, a much better shot at actually allowing us to build extreme scale systems. And with that, I'm done.